Maybe some of you are old enough to remember, judging by the crowd, many of you are old enough to remember uh, the pretty famous uh, Coca-Cola commercial, I'd like to teach the world to sing in perfect harmony. And I'd like to buy the world a Coke and keep it company. I mean, wouldn't that be nice if we could just get the world together through song? And then if we happen to profit off some sugar-based dark cola in the process, then, then all the better. It's interesting, that sort of saccharine optimism has fallen on hard times, hasn't it? Pepsi learned that the hard way during uh, the riots when they thought they were going to solve all the problems of race relations through a Kardashian and a can of soda, and that went over like a lead balloon. But what if... I mean, what if the world could be changed through a song? I mean, our text this morning, oddly, because I'm sure most of us haven't studied it in great detail, is a pretty important one in Israel's history. It really does mark a shift, a progression, a formal change in Israel's life and in her worship. It is one of, if not the largest celebration, at least to date at this point in history, uh, in Israel's history, the largest celebration that Israel has beheld. Uh, you are witnessing, at least uh, up to uh, before this song, there's a great party going on. There's this parade of somewhat epic proportions. All the elders of Israel have been called out. Children are lining, if you will, the parade route. Uh, we have all of David's mighty men in full battle regalia marching, and we have the Levites dressed in their official attire, carrying the Ark of the Covenant as it's covered in its own cloths and is being held on poles. And every six steps, they stop and they make a sacrifice before they take the seventh step. And they do that as they proceed all the way into Jerusalem. The band is playing at full volume, we are told. There is no missing it as the sound is probably deafening as it approaches. There are horns and trumpets and cymbals, uh, the strained sounds of the harp and the lyre. There's a full choir singing along as the Ark of the Covenant makes its way. And even the king, David himself, is dressed oddly like a priest and dancing with reckless abandon, much to the chagrin of his wife as the procession takes place. And why? Well, because the Ark of the Covenant was about to return and be set in the kingly capital of Zion. For the very first time in history, God would dwell on his holy mountain in Zion. I mean, it's something that we sing about. We know the Psalms. It's something maybe that's familiar to us, even in our hymnody. But this is the moment in Israel's history where the ark is finally placed on God's holy mountain for the very first time. I mean, up until this point in Israel's history, it traveled with them in the tabernacle as they made their way in the wilderness wanderings. Somewhere along the line in their history, right prior to the reign of Saul, the ark had been captured and Saul, for whatever reason, or we're told his, in one sense, lack of spirituality, never sought the return of the ark during the entirety of his reign. It sat dormant. The ark was not present among God's people. And David, at this point in his own history, as he is now king, starts to tire of seeing the blessings of God being poured out on the people who are harboring the ark. And he decides that he wants to return it to its rightful place. He wants to sit God's throne with his own throne in the capital city. And for once, God's king and God the king would reign in the capital in Israel for the first time in its history. It's interesting, the first time David tried it, tried it, uh, things did not go well. Uh, he thought it would be a good idea to return the ark, but he didn't pay much attention to the prescriptions of Moses. They put the ark on a new cart. Uh, they had a, 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 an ox. Uh, they, they had some uh, cattle uh, pulling the, the ark, and they stumbled on the way. And Uzzah reached up his hand to keep the ark from falling to the earth, and he died immediately. Instead of a party, they had a funeral. Uh, but today, it's a lot different. In this particular celebration, the Levites are doing as they were instructed exactly 
according to the prescription of Moses. The ark is being carried on poles, not being carted on a cart. Every six steps, they're making their offerings. They're showing proper reverence to both the word of God and the presence of God in their midst, lest he strike out against them. And it becomes for them a high day. This is the arrival of God the King to what will be called his holy resting space for, for, for the first time in Israel's history. And what we see above all is that it is a time filled with music and song. Now, that may not immediately strike you. You know the story somewhat from 1 Samuel. But Samuel covers this story in chapter 6 in a few verses. He doesn't tell us about the big parade. He doesn't sing the song to us. He does talk a lot about uh, David's wife and her disapproving looks, which you'll notice the chronicler doesn't spend much time on at all. He is much more interested in the Levitical priesthood and the music that accompanies what's happening here because it is a genuine shift in how Israel worships at this point in her life. Up until now, worshiping under Moses it was a pretty quiet affair, bloody, but nearly silent. Yes, there was confessions to be made at certain slaughterings of certain animals during certain sacrifices. And yes, a horn would blow at the evening sacrifice, but other than that, it was an utterly silent affair. Where we maybe could see, if you will, the, the, the holiness and the, the terror of God, but not much joy in relation to what was happening. But there's a, a major shift in the rule of David where song begins to break out in the history of Israel. That changes on this day. It's an event so big that songs are actually called for. Music is made. So big that we see the Levites get called into special action they are to sing and to play instruments. We've known them. We've known their ritual duties around the tabernacle. And we've known them to be warriors even. But we haven't known them much to be musicians. And you will have a hard time finding in Moses all of the commandments concerning music and instrumentation. These are given from David to the Levites at this point in his rule. You'll see this phrase even in our text, before the ark. The Levites sing before the ark. David in chapter 17 comes before the ark and he sings and prays. The people stand before. That is unheard of in Israel's history. No one stands before the ark. I mean, not even the high priest stands before the ark. The only person in Israel's history who gets to see the ark is the high priest. And he never stops moving when he's in the presence of it as he ministers in the Holy of Holies. And he does that one time a year. But here, all of a sudden, in 1 Chronicles 16, we have several Levites, at least a whole company of Levites before the ark. The king is before the ark and others. It's a strange transition for whatever reason, as we'll see in Israel's history. And we're given in this text a song to not only mark this happening, but to train us on how to sing in light of what has happened. This really is a psalm that teaches us how to sing in light of what has taken place in the nation on this day. So what has taken place? Uh, well, before we get too far of that, let me ask this question. Why? Why are we taught to sing? I mean, hear me here. Because if you don't get anything else out of this sermon, you should at least get this. Because worship is the goal of our humanity. Our life ends in the presence of God in song. On that day, it says, there will be a company that no man can count of every tribe and tongue and nation and kindred singing praise to, the, to God and to the Lamb. When people come to Jesus, that is the end in view for them. Part of our salvation, or you know, the, the goal of our salvation at least terminates there. Our goal is to see God, to, to witness him face to face, to be in his presence and to worship before him. Even as Jesus said, the hour has come and now is when true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For indeed, notice, 
The Father seeks such to worship him. As God goes about seeking and saving in the world, what he is doing is he's seeking those who will ultimately worship him. And that's what we see in the last book of the Bible. There are songs everywhere and companies of people singing everywhere in the presence of God. I mean, all the other things that the church does serve this end. So we do missions so that people will join in this worship. We evangelize so more choir members will be added, if you will. We raise our children so they may join this song with us. The goal of worship is worship. I mean, what you're doing here is what you will be doing there. I mean, this is a precursor to your end because it's the very goal of the whole world, which is why what we do in worship, Lord's Day after Lord's Day, is central, not peripheral, and why worship should be the central thing happening here, not a whole bunch of other activities that ultimately take its place. As one has said, history moves toward a song. So this much more musical moment in Israel's history is instructive because it teaches us about the very movement of history itself. Let me repeat that because it's a mouthful. <laughs> the reason why this story is instructive to us is because it shows us the very arc of our own history, where the future is headed. And it teaches us the songs that we sing. I mean, so what happened here that required all of this merrymaking and music? You'll notice the ark has ascended and God's rule with God's king has begun. They've been brought together for the first time in history. God's throne and the king of God's people's throne are in the same place. And in that sense, it's the beginning of the end. And that was the goal of Israel's history, to get a son of David on the throne with God ruling on his throne and to train and teach and lead the nations from that place. What were they to train them to do? to ascribe to the Lord the glory that is due his name. And so what we see in 1 Chronicles, what appears to be the kind of last step in Israel's history before all of this starts to unfold. And so what do you do when it's the beginning of the end? You do what's natural, you sing. I mean, every time there's a great victory or every time you come to some sort of terminus and completion, the appropriate thing to do is celebrate. And that's what we see here in Scripture. And so let us look at the song this morning. What we get is a bit of a remix. Uh, the, the author of the psalm samples several deep cuts from the Psalter. Uh, you've probably heard them before. Uh, there was no copyright law, so he went for it. Um, you see three psalms make up this particular song, Psalm 105 and 106 and Psalm 96. Uh, and they're all arranged in a particular way to make a new song. And it is new. It's very specific for this group of people in this place. Because it's been rearranged, it is, in one sense, a fourth song. It's not just three songs mixed together. And so here's what I want us to see, at least first from the song, that they're commanded to sing. You can't help uh, but notice the Ten Commandments to praise. In case you missed it, they're all over those first, uh, you know, uh, verses from 8 to 13 Give thanks to the Lord, call upon his name, make known his deeds, sing to him, sing praise to him, tell of his wondrous works, glory in his name, rejoice. Seek the Lord and his strength. Seek his presence continually. Remember the wondrous works that he has done. So they are commanded, the whole company of Israel is called to praise the Lord. That is the command given. And that praise includes thanks and recounting God's deeds and glorying in his name, which simply means to glory in his person, in his might, in his mercy, in his works. His name stands for his being, all that he is and does for the nation. And so the first thing that his people are called to do is to praise his name. And then he gives the reasons to sing. And you'll see this in verses 14 and following. 
And it follows this past, present, and future orientation. And so he begins with the past, you'll notice, in 14 to 22. You can't miss, again, the covenantal language. He made a promise. He made a covenant with you because he's the one that keeps faith for a thousand generations, just like he promised to Abraham. He swore to Isaac. He made a statute with Jacob. He links up every promise word he can think of from the Old Testament that shows God's binding himself to his people, and he lays it before them. He says, remember the nature of your God. He is a covenant-keeping, a promise-making God who is faithful to our fathers. He says, you remember how your fathers came into the land? They were, and he puts even the people hearing the song in place with them, they were few in number. And so he's talking about their entrance into the promised land, those daunting days where they see the walls of Jericho, they see the mighty fortresses, and they realize their weakness as they are not trained soldiers, they are a company uh, full uh, of exposure. Uh, they don't have, again, fortresses to, to protect themselves. And he says, remember, they were few in number with enemies all around. But God was faithful and he established them in the land. Why? Because he's a God who keeps his promises. So he reminds them to remember the past. And then he brings the reality of the present in verses 23 through 29. So he says, declare his glory among the nations. Ascribe to the Lord, O families of the peoples. And then he says, this is what you're to ascribe. What's true right now. He is the Lord of all creation. He made it. And he's greater than all the other gods. Every God that's surrounding you of all the other nations, the God that you serve is the one true God. All of those others, he says, are frauds. They're worthless. They're useless. Notice the ark has just been set on Zion's hill. And in the surrounding nations, it's not uncommon to set your God on the hill of your territory. But all that you're saying when you do that is, our God rules this space, our territory, wherever our fences, if you will, our, our borders are. But as soon as God ark lands in Jerusalem, notice what he says. He says, okay, every nation glorify me. All peoples ascribe to my name the glory that's due to it. He claims ownership, not just of Israel and her territories, but he claims ownership of the entirety of the earth and says that praise is due him from all the nations. God isn't enthroned over merely Israel, we learn. He's the king of the world because he made it all. And notice he says he is so presently, and that is why he is calling for their praise presently, the praise of the nations. So he's currently the king of all. And then he points to the future in verses 30 and following. Notice the establishment of the throne in Zion leads to this declaration of cosmic proportions. You'll notice the whole earth begins to celebrate. Literally the things, the, the terra firma of the world and all that's planted on it begins to join in the choir with the Levites. It says the heavens are celebrating, the earth is glad, the sea is roaring, the fields are exulting, the trees are singing for joy. You'll notice the choir just continues to grow as God's throne is established in Jerusalem. And what you're seeing here again is the goal of the world. What Paul says in Romans 8, at present, because of our sin, what's happening? It says the whole world is groaning and longing for the revelations of the son, the revelation of the sons of God because it has been put under subjection or futility because of what man has done. But when this throne is established, you'll notice even the trees and the heavens and the seas begin to celebrate because they've been set free. And as the terra firma begins to celebrate, the nations again are called to join, ascribe you families of the earth, worship the Lord, tremble before him. The nations are being offered a spot in this parade, in this choir, which again is strange. If you look at Israel's songs up to this point, the nations are usually simply being told about the defeat that is coming their way. 
how God's wrath is about to be poured out on them, how he's going to fight for his people and destroy them as he comes. But all of a sudden, as these two thrones join together, the song goes out and it says that the nations now can also join in with Israel and become one with them as God's people. All because he's king and he's enthroned on his holy mountain with his king. Well, if we have here in 1 Chronicles 16, a song that we are called to sing because of what's happening, I want us to see this final thing, is that we're to sing while we wait. I mean, we have this beautiful celebration before us, written by the chronicler, different again than Samuel. He shows the extent not only of the celebration, but if you will, he kind of turns up the dial on the stereo so that they can hear how loud the song is and kind of, you know, uh, with it be pulled into the rejoicing. But what's odd about it is when he's writing this. I mean, most of us uh, probably don't feel this because of where this book is placed. It comes to us right after our other books of Samuel and Kings and Chronicles, and we figure what are all written about the same time. But if you look at particular versions of the Hebrew Bible, interestingly, Chronicles is the last book of the Old Testament. And so by the time this is compiled, the history that's chronicled in the book of Chronicles goes from Adam to the reign of Cyrus and Persia, which means David hasn't been on the throne for quite some time. In fact, all the sons of David have shown their unfaithfulness until finally the whole nation was carried off into captivity. The temple was destroyed. The ark hasn't been seen in years. They stayed in captivity for about 500 years, were returned, but when they returned, no ark came with them and no Davidic son is ruling on the throne. And this grand vision of God enthroned with his king seems like a distant, past memory. And yet the chronicler sticks it here and says, look at the celebration and learn this song so that you can sing it too. But you've got to you know, imagine if you're one of those coming from the diaspora back into the land, your situation is a whole lot more like Israel was in the wilderness coming into the promised land for the first time. The nation of Israel isn't the ascendant power in the land right now. They don't have a king dominating everyone else. They're basically living on, on, if you will, borrowed land, on borrowed time. Yes, they're allowed to be there, but they don't have much authority. These are not the high days of the kingdom of David and Solomon. These are low days that only look back on these things as faint memories of the good times. And the chronicler says, Here's this song, and it needs to be in your mouth during this time. I mean, it seems cruel, to be honest. It seems, you know, almost like, can you imagine having a party like this with a king and like, you know, the Ark of the Covenant? It would be awesome. This is the song we sang. Uh, you should sing it too, even though it has nothing to do with your life and doesn't look like your actual reality. Why would he do that? I mean, it seems more fitting, you know, Psalms like Psalm 137, right? When, when they were in, in Babylon, they, you know, how can we sing songs of Zion when we sit in a foreign land? Like, how do you want me to sing about the temple when I live as a slave? And even now they're saying, how do you want me to sing about the king and God and the nations coming to God and us ruling over the nations when we don't have any rule and it doesn't seem like the nations are going to bow the knee anytime soon. The song is written to them for a reason. At this very moment in their history, and they're called to sing it, to join in it. And as you will find, so are we. It's not because they have a king or an ark, because they have neither but they have the truth of the God that is testified about in this song. You'll notice he can't help but repeat time and time again, he's the God 
who keeps his covenant to a thousand generations. He's the God that kept his promise to Abraham. He kept his vow to Isaac. He kept his statute to Jacob. He keeps his promises to our fathers, which means the promise that he made to give them a land is still a promise that is hanging over your reality right now because this God speaks and he does not lie or change his mind. He remembered our forefathers. They were few, but he was faithful. Even they were surrounded by enemies. You are few, but God remembers even when our enemies surround us. He's the God of creation even now and every other God that is tempting you is a fraud. And so he wants them to sing these words as they wait in faith for God to keep his promise in the midst of their time of waiting. He's the God of the future, a God that will have all nations come to him. So they sing as they wait on God's faithfulness. But of course that feels different. That is emotionally different than the emotions found in this text. The emotions in this text are a celebration and there seems like, again, a, a, a prayer wish. <laughs> we'll sing it, but it sure doesn't seem true, and it doesn't feel true at this current moment. I mean, the song he gives them is a song about when things are accomplished, but they're supposed to be singing it now while they're waiting as a song of faith. They're given a song in a major key when their life feels like a minor key almost every day. It's the story we hear time and again in the Old Testament that are to wait on God and wait on his promises as if they are certain and they are present because this is the God of creation who every other God bows to who always keeps his promises. And as the Old Testament closes with songs like this on the lips of Israel and in the memories of the people, into this story, we hear of a young child to be born from the seed of David in the city of David. But he's not just a royal son. He's God's son. He's the very presence of God in their midst. So all of a sudden, you start to hear these echoes of, there's this kid coming who's born in the right place. He's in Bethlehem, the city of David. He's born of the line of David. He, he's a son of David, but he's also one in whom the Spirit of God dwells, the very presence of God in our midst. He's both the ark and the king. And upon the announcement of him coming, what happens? Songs just start to come all over the text. Angels start singing and Zechariah starts singing and Mary starts singing and Simeon starts singing. As soon as Luke begins to tell us of these faint whispers of what's coming, the songs that the chronicler was saying were made for us in the time of God's reign, begin to burst out onto the pages of Bi the Bible again. All because the presence of God and the reign of God have come in Christ Jesus. At the coming of Jesus, and ultimately through his death and resurrection and his ascension, the beginning of the end has actually come. The thing that they were assuming in 1 Chronicles 16 has actually taken place in our lifetime. God's king sits on his holy hill at the right hand of God and before his face. And he sings there, according to Hebrews 2. He sings on behalf of us, his brethren. He sings with us because he's won. Because the battle really is over. The victory really has been gained. And then he says to us, here's the song. Now sing it. But of course it feels to us like we're receiving the song at the end of Chronicles. <laughs> As we look around, it doesn't look like the victories won. The enemies look a lot larger at times than our God, and their gods seem a lot more powerful, at least at face value, than our own. But God has promised us that Satan is doomed, that our enemies have been defeated, that the nations are going to join in this song or be scattered on the way that these things are taking place. We live in a time of celebration and a time of waiting, and hopefully we feel both. <laughs> I mean, that's what we do here every Lord's Day. We remember that there's something to celebrate, even if Monday through Saturday 
felt like we lost. <laughs> because this is what's true. The messianic king has come into the city and God's throne has been established. God's presence is in our midst. We are surrounded, yes, by enemies and we aren't home yet. And you know what God says we should do as we wait? He simply says, sing these things. That may sound strange to you and useless, uh, may seem weak in comparison to the problems that you face, and yet it's exactly what is commanded. We're commanded to celebrate Him and His faithfulness and His victory by faith. It is your most important calling because it's your end. This is how you're going to live the rest of your eternity but it's also how you bring the end to pass. This is how we get from here to there. As one author writes, music doesn't just prepare us for battle. Song is itself a form of warfare. Music is armor. Song is a weapon. You'll notice before David fights Goliath with a sling and a stone, before he defeats the Philistines, he fights off the evil spirit that plagues Saul, and he does it with his harp. He can fight the Philistines with a stone, he can put enemies to flight with a sword, but for a demon, he brings out the heavy artillery, a lyre of 10 strings, and he fights with his fingers and his voice. You see, we are called through our singing to testify to the watching world, to bear witness, that word martyria, right? To be martyrs in our singing, to bear a testimony to the entire world. And we do so in song by declaring, declaring God's glory to the nations. What you're doing when you sing really is warfare week in and week out. We're declaring to the powers that be that there is an actual king who reigns over them and the gods of this world are weak in comparison. It's a declaration to them of fact and hopefully it's a declaration to us that builds our faith. We do this week in and week out as a priesthood, you now are a holy priesthood. You have been enlisted into this service. You are a part of this choir, and this is your duty to declare God's glory through song and in so doing testify to the watching world and even the principalities and the powers of what you believe concerning the reign of God. As one author writes, singing is itself an act of witness. In the murmuring and raging hubbub of the world, we raise our voices and so testify to another king, Jesus, enthroned above all rule and authority and power and dominion. And so, Christian, if you want the world to join in song, uh, if you want to join in, in Coca-Cola's quest, it's really God's quest. They just try to co-opt it for a buck. It won't be affected first and foremost at the voting booth, as important as that may be, but it'll be affected right here, gathering to sing the songs, declaring the glory of King Jesus, declaring his rule among the nations and his victory over all until the walls do indeed fall down as the gates of hell cannot and will not prevail against the testimony of his church. Let's pray.